will always get it wrong, like the explanation for the aurora, because all the tourists, um, all the tourism people mostly like, get it wrong as well, because they always tell you that the aurora is caused by charged particles from the sun that are caught up in the Earth's magnetic field and funneled to Earth. That's like the standard explanation of the aurora. It is not actually true. And it really <laughs> irritates me. And I, maybe you're going to think I'm like a pedantic scientist or something, but it's not actually true. It's the first kind of plausible explanation that was come up with for the aurora about 100 years ago, over 100 years ago now. Before that, everyone thought the aurora was, or the explanations were things like fires in the sky or vapors or you know they didn't know what it was basically um so why is it not this well firstly because if if these charged particles were just coming down to earth down the magnetic field lines then from the sun they're going to hit on the day side of the planet right because mm -hmm. they're coming from the sun and we don't see the aurora on the day side of the planet because well you wouldn't see it it's too too light outside mm -hmm. you see it on the night side so somehow the particles are getting round to the back and also some particles do actually drip in mm -hmm. on the day side okay. and they make a very, very faint aurora that we can't see anyway. Um, they don't have enough energy to make the bright, um, you know, amazing aurora displays that we see. So somehow they're getting around the back and somehow they're getting more energy. And so the thing about the aurora, the, the most important thing about the aurora is that charged particles are being accelerated to Earth. They're coming in faster. They're hitting the atmosphere. Mm -hmm with lots of energy and that's what's making the beautiful aurora displays and so I think that a more accurate explanation of what causes the aurora is that it's charged particles that are accelerated into the Earth's upper atmosphere and this is all triggered by the Sun. I think if it's low altitude if it's like red or like high altitude I think it turns out like a green so what was like behind this that color kind of changes? You're right, it depends on it depends on the gas in the yeah. atmosphere. So mostly the, the green color is the one that we see the most often, that comes mm -hmm. from oxygen. Oh. And uh, then the, you also get a sort of pinky and purpley colors mm -hmm. from nitrogen. Mm -hmm. And they tend to happen, those colors come lower in the atmosphere because mm -hmm. as uh, the atmosphere, the, the gases sort of separate a bit as you go higher mm -hmm. up. So there's a bit more oxygen higher mm -hmm. up and the nitrogen's a bit lower. And um, But you can also get a red color from oxygen that also happens very, very high in the atmosphere. Um, but you don't see, it's much yeah. harder to see that color. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, they, the colors come from the different gases. And what's interesting about that is that you can also see uh, aurora on other planets mm -hmm. as well. Oh. And if you do see aurora on other planets, you can learn a little bit about that planet's atmosphere oh. by the color of the aurora. That because, makes total sense. Yeah, yeah. because the, it depends on the type, like, on the gas. So each, mm -hmm. each element, each gas releases a particular characteristic color. Oh, wow. So you can actually sort of use it to diagnose um, atmospheres in space. And you also have another book on fusion. So yeah. for our viewers, could you please explain how the fusion works? Yeah, so, well, how everything kind of works yeah, not is really. a big one <laughs> because like fusion's massive, uh, you know, the field is massive. But in uh, the, the, the very um, basics of it, fusion is what's happening in the sun and the stars. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's like the energy of the universe, if you like, mm -hmm. the, the, like the basic energy of the universe. And uh, what's happening is particles are coming together, mm -hmm. they're joining together, and when they do that, they create energy. So mm -hmm. in stars, hydrogen is fusing together to make helium, mm -hmm. and actually bigger ones in stars, can mm -hmm. bigger um, particles can fuse as well. So mm -hmm. hydrogen forms to make, uh, fuses to make helium, mm -hmm. and then you can like fuse the helium and you can make carbon and oxygen mm -hmm. and nitrogen and all the bigger elements. So that's what's happening uh, in stars. It's like Lego bricks, like yeah. building up. Um, and essentially what scientists are trying to do on Earth Mm -hmm. um, if they're trying to make energy, yeah. is they're trying to replicate this reaction on mm -hmm. Earth and and get more energy out than they have to put in to make mm -hmm. it happen. Because fusion's really hard because you actually mm -hmm. have to make the conditions that we find in the centers of stars mm -hmm. in order to get fusion to occur. So mm -hmm. really extreme conditions, like temperatures of hundreds of millions of degrees. Um, and you have to keep your keep those particles that you want to fuse together. You've mm -hmm. got to get them like close enough together and hot enough yeah. for long enough for the particles to fuse. And so that's the challenge on Earth. It's finding some way of, we talk about confinement a lot, because you have to trap this your fuel mm -hmm. so that you can get it to the conditions that you need. So you have to confine it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we're always talking about confinement and yeah. finding different ways that we can trap our fuels and get them hot enough and dense enough for long enough for fusion reactions to mm -hmm. occur and keep occurring so that we can actually start extracting some of the energy. And that's, that's the aim of, fusion power on earth. Okay, I don't know if you watch Iron Man. 
Have you watched Iron I Fist? I have seen it a long, long time ago. Oh, okay. I have. <laughs> I mean, not I think I... Not recently, but I know it's fusion. <laughs> okay, perfect. So if we were to uh, miniaturize ITER and make it like super small and create that mini arc reactor Iron Man, Iron Man has, do you think that will that could be a thing in the future? Uh, oh, I think it's crazy. <laughs> I mean, to put... <laughs> why you'd want to put something like, like that in your <laughs> in body? Your body. Um, I think... Wasn't the arc reactor, I don't know if they were doing some kind of cold fusion thing. It, it looked like a tokamak and they actually went to Jet, which is the, the big tokamak in, uh, in Oxfordshire. And they, I remember they, like, I was there at the time, they spoke to the, the teams there. Uh, so they got their inspiration for the designs and what it should look like from the Jet tokamak. But then in the film, they talk about palladium, like which isn't in a, that's a cold fusion mm -hmm. thing. You wouldn't put it in a tokamak style reactor. It's a, it's a heavy metal. Um, so there are lots of like inconsistencies mm -hmm. and also I think I saw in the film the little arc reactor was, a, was supposedly producing three gigawatts mm -hmm. three gigawatts is massive that's like a power station that can power <laughs> millions of homes yeah. and he wanted to put it in his body and it all seems kind of crazy to me but that's what these but he said something about didn't he say uh, yeah it can power it can power bigger things and so obviously he's using it to power his yeah. super suit I think um the, I think they found an, in, the, in the movie, they found a new element and they are using that element to kind of power the reactor, uh -huh. which is not the case, probably it's just all fictional. But yeah, yeah. in the movie, they had like, they just found a new element out of nowhere. That's handy. And then they <laughs> use that to yeah, power the um, reactor. But yeah, I mean, yeah. you never know because about fusion, when it comes to fusion, I never say like never because years ago, we didn't even have like private companies doing fusion. People didn't even believe in fusion, but now we are talking about fusion. We are processing like things mm. going well. Even like I think China and also like Italy as well, they uh, made it work for like five seconds or something, which is yeah. I think promising. So yeah, incrementally all the time, people are doing like yeah. better things. And yeah. yeah, there's a there's a quote that I learned when I was writing the book about the aurora, because um, it's by Friedhof Nansen, who was a polar explorer from from Norway, and a quote that I love, and he said. Um, the difficult is what takes a little time. Mm -hmm. The impossible takes a bit little longer. Um, and I love that because it's like things are not necessarily impossible or rather just because something is impossible now doesn't mean it's always going to be impossible because technologies are changing all the time. And uh, so, yeah, I always think about that. You, you can't just say it's never going to happen because you don't know what's around the corner. Exactly, especially for the net zero goals. I think nowadays everyone's just working on clean energy uh, sources. And when I think about net zero, I think you mentioned in one of your videos as well. I think fusion is the solution because it's like 100% clean energy. And then if we get to get that, if we get to kind of create fusion, I think uh, by the time when we get to 2030 or like sorry, by the time when we get to 2050, which is the goal at the moment, I think we will be just like ticking all the boxes we need to achieve. I think fusion is essential for like our long-term clean energy future. I think that if if human beings want to exist like on this planet and have everybody have a, a good decent standard of living, you know, increasing all the energy demands from what they are now, then we need an energy source like fusion. And even if it can't help us get to the net zero goals, I kind of hope it will contribute, but it takes time anyway to roll out a technology. You're not just going to get fusion tomorrow or in 10 years and it's done, it's gonna take time to roll mm -hmm. out. Um, but I think that in the longer term, like we need it. So the sooner we can have it, the better. Mm -hmm. um, but even if we need, to, we, at the moment, we need to use every technology we can to get to our net zero mm -hmm. goals. So we need to be building out more solar, more wind, um, you know, more fission, like we need to be using everything that we can. Um, but in the longer term, like I believe that even if we do hit our net zero goals, there will probably be a good Another. chunk of fossil fuels in the mix and that has to go ultimately and fusion can replace that so yeah it, it has to it has to be done just one other interesting thing about science fiction stuff um so i like the way even though some of this science fiction stuff sounds really it is crazy right it's science fiction um but it's kind of interesting sort of thinking about what may be possible mm -hmm. and so uh, I say that because I worked with a, um, as a fusion consultant a few years back uh, on a TV show and, and it was really interesting to look at their scripts of what they wanted to happen and then my job was to try and make it 
almost possible. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and it's hard because there's always the constraints of like they want drama, so they want explosions and death and like all of these kind of things, which obviously like I don't really want with, with no. fusion or at all. Um, but th that's you know th there's those constraints. But even just in terms of the science, like they come in with this idea of like we want it to be able to do this and do that, and how could it work? And it was really fascinating to me to actually try and think about like okay what do we know now on the physics side and like what how could we extrapolate it possibly like because you can't just do something well, people do just, just do crazy science fiction things but um it's uh, to me it's more interesting if it's kind of plausible so if you kind of say like this is what they want this is where they want to go with it how can i feasibly kind of take it from what we actually know here and think about how we could possibly do something like that. And I think that it was actually really interesting for me to be able uh, to do that. Um, because yeah, it's like, a, it's like this mind stretching mm -hmm. of like what could maybe be possible, artistic license and everything as well. But I like the fact that you're trying to root it in the science and get to something a bit more crazy. Exactly. I think that's always a good idea, kind of feeling from other people, because as a scientist, you just like kind of focus on the things you can do. When you, but when you hear something about like someone else saying something maybe crazy, but at, si at the same point, you feel like, you know what, that might work. And then I think it just happens all the time, because uh, every time when we say, oh, it's impossible, years later, oh, it's there, it just yeah. happened. Uh, because it's Rockets and Coffee, we are asking our guests to bring their favorite mug. Uh, so would you like to explain? <laughs> What's your favorite mug and then why is it? Yeah, I have a confession. I, <laughs> I actually for, I forgot my mug. Um, I have a really bad memory. I even picked one specially. I, it, I went back to an old, and I was going to bring you a, an old mug that I used to use when I was a PhD student. And it was actually at my mum's house. Oh. I even got it out of the cupboard at my mum's house. It's been sitting on my kitchen counter all week. <laughs> so I wouldn't forget it. But obviously, you know, because it's been there all week, I'm just, <laughs> I you forgot just... it. I forgot it. I'm really sorry. Um, so yeah, th oh, this is a nice space themed one. Um, yeah, my PhD mug, the reason that I used to like it, oh, the reason I bought it, it was, it was pink and it had like, I'm a princess, I'm a princess, I'm a princess. Like they were fashionable, like, I don't know, 20 years ago, this particular designer. And um, I was a PhD student in a fusion lab. I was like, no one is ever going to steal my mug if I, if I have this, I'm a princess <laughs> mug. I was right. They, oh. never, they never stole my mug. We so. might just have a little photo of the mug and just put it here <laughs> so people can see it. I'll that. send you one. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great idea. If you have those kind of mugs, no one's going to take so it. So it's not my current favorite mug, but uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Melanie. It was a real pleasure having you here. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, you can find out about uh, Fusion on the website, www.fusionenergyinsights.com. You can sign up for our newsletter and you can also find us on LinkedIn and on X. Oh, perfect. And also, please make sure you also write uh, down in comments your questions and then make sure you follow us and then subscribe. Bye.